Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the National Library of Australia. I'm Dr. Shalene Robinson, Director of Curatorial and Collection Research here at the National Library. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Australia's First Nations peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and give my respect to the elders, past and present, and through them, to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Thank you for attending this afternoon's presentation by the Library's 2020 Creative Arts Fellow for Australian Writing. The annual Creative Arts Fellowship for Australian Writing is supported by the Ray Matthew and Eva Colesman Trust. This trust was established through a generous bequest made to the Library by New York Arts patron Eva Colesman in honour of the Australian poet, dramatist and writer Ray Matthew to support and promote Australian literary research and writing. This fellowship aims to allow writers to develop their creative works by immersing themselves in an aspect of the National Library's collection. Today we welcome Nadia Bailey, our 2020 Creative Arts Fellow for Australian Writing. After having to put her research on hold, uh, initially last year due to the fires and then of course the pandemic, we were delighted that Nadia was able to finally begin her research at the library last month. Nadia is a Melbourne-based author, journalist and editor. She was a 2019 UNESCO City of Literature's creative resident in Krakow, Poland and a 2018 Midsummer Futures Fellow. Her essays, short fiction and poetry have been widely represented in anthologies and journals and she's published several books on popular culture with Smith Street Books. During her fellowship, Nadia has been undertaking background research for a work of historical fiction set in the final days of World War I entitled Darkened Rooms. Her novel will explore the emotional impact of war on those who are left behind, the search for meaning amidst such great loss, and people's interest in spiritualism as a means of connecting with those who had passed. Her novel will reimagine Australia's post-wartime history and foster reflection on contemporary concerns surrounding faith, remembrance, and queer identity. Today, Nadia will share her research into these areas as well as reading a draft sample from the novel. So if you could please join me in welcoming Nadia Bailey to the stage. Thank you for that very kind introduction and thank you all so much for coming today. It's been a long, strange road to doing this fellowship. As Shirlene mentioned, I initially was scheduled to come to the library in February of 2020, but because of the horrific bushfires of that summer, I decided to postpone my visit until the middle of the year, by which point the pandemic had happened and I was stuck in Melbourne in lockdown, unable to travel further than five kilometers from my home, far less interstate. So it's with great pleasure and no small amount of gratitude that I'm able to be here today. I came to this fellowship to undertake research for my novel In Progress, a work of historical fiction set in Australia in the final days of the First World War. It tells the story of a young woman, Eden Sibley, whose brother has disappeared on the front, maybe missing, maybe dead. Bereft and grieving, she turns to a spiritualist medium named Maud Campion to help her find out her brother's fate through occult means. The novel deals with questions of faith and fact, grief and memory, science and the supernatural. And it's also a love story between Eden and Maud, who managed to find happiness with each other in a time when queer relationships were kept hidden. The National Library's uh, Creative Arts Fellowship for Australian Writing, supported by the Ray Matthew and Eva Colesman Trust, offers writers like myself the opportunity to develop their creative ideas by immersing themselves in the collections. For me, this meant the chance to uh, dig deep into spiritualism's history in Australia and try to understand why so many rational men and women place their faith in this belief system. How spirit mediums convinced them that communication with the dead was possible and what spiritualism's impact was on the Australian experience of the Great War. It led me into what I can confidently say is some of the odder corners of the archives, where I found and read books like Spookland, 
a record of research and experiment in a much talked of realm of mystery with a review and criticism of the so-called spiritualistic phenomena of spirit, spirit materialization by T. Shackleton Henry. It might be helpful at this stage for me to outline what I mean when I talk about spiritualism. Spiritualism, or spiritism as it was sometimes known, doesn't mean spirituality in its general sense. Rather, I'm referring to a specific belief system which grew out of the experiences of a pair of teenage sisters in America in the 1840s and centered around the belief that death was not the end, that those who had passed over could communicate with the living and that with the right kind of training, it was possible for one who was sensitive to such things to receive messages from beyond the veil. In the spiritualist belief, death was viewed as simply the withdrawal of the physical man clothed in his ethereal body from the physical body as one would withdraw a hand from a glove. Many of you will be familiar with the Ouija board and the seance, the joining of hands, the calling up of spirits, now a hallmark of Gothic literature and the standard stuff of horror movies. But before these things became embedded in popular culture, they were part of a genuinely held belief system that, although is most associated with the Victorian era, actually continued well into the 20th century and enjoyed a resurgence of popularity during the First World War, a time when death was so present in everyday life. As I began looking into the scholarship on this subject, I quickly discovered that the majority of studies focus on spiritualism's golden age, the Victorian era, while its popularity into the 20th century is treated largely as an afterthought. Similarly, spiritualism in an Australian context has gone largely unexamined, though its popularity here cannot be denied. There was, for example, a dedicated spiritualist journal called The Harbinger of Light that was published monthly from 1870 all the way through to the mid-1950s, while spiritualist churches and lyceums had dedicated buildings in major cities and active chapters in places as far-flung as the Kimberley. As a journalist in the Protestant Standard wrote in 1871, the system called spiritualism or spiritism with its allies, table turning, planchette, et hoc genus omne, have found for themselves a new youth in the genial clime of sunny Australia. It's from this place that the idea for my novel arose and this particular time when ghosts were not feared but longed for and the uncanny was welcomed into suburban Australian parlors through the medium's esoteric skills. My area of interest is less about whether these experiences of materialization, thought transference or spirit communication were real and more about how people experienced them whether they came with complete faith or existential doubt. The question of whether spiritualist mediums could actually, were actually able to communicate with the dead doesn't much matter. Only the effects of believing it matter here. For example, we may doubt that the Sydney-based Reverend Thomas Downs, author of The Way, The Truth and The Light, Spiritual Philosophy and Phenomena, Positive Re Revelation, was visited by the spirit of his enlisted brother late one autumn evening in 1917, or that this spirit told the Reverend that he was now on a march upward toward those bright spirit people and not a march looking for the enemy. But that visitation, or whatever it was, was clearly profoundly meaningful to the Reverend, and the account of it was meaningful to many others, and it had a very real effect on him and how he faced his bereavement. And of course, Reverend Downs was not alone. These were not beliefs only held by the oddball few. Countless other thoughtful and intelligent people had and recorded experiences of this kind in the years during and after the First World War. Though it's often remembered as a fringe pursuit orchestrated by tricksters and embraced by the credulous, spiritualism was in fact a major cultural force. And though the phenomena may have been fraudulent, the faith in it was real. And for me, that is worth studying. 
Spiritualism's history could conceivably be traced back as far as human life itself, as there have, has probably always been some kind of conception of a world beyond the physical, of ghosts, souls, or spirits. But as a defined doctrine, it probably starts in 1743 with Emanuel Swedenborg, a Swedish mathematician who, when he was 55 years old, began to experience spiritual visions and went on to write several books about his clairvoyant and psychic gifts. In 1788, Franz Anton Mesmer, a Viennese doctor, developed the theory and practice of mesmerism in which he would put an afflicted person into a trance state and prompt them to diagnose their own ailments. The mesmeric trance went on to develop into a means of communication with the world of the soul. But it was in 1848 that the movement crystallized with an incident known as the Hydesville Knockings. In a village in Wayne County, New York State, there lived a family consisting of two teenage girls, Margareta and Catherine, and their parents, John and Margaret Fox. The family began to be disturbed by loud rappings and knockings in the night, which were found to show intelligence. That is, there seemed to be some kind of consciousness present that could answer questions by responding with these mysterious sounds. Through rapping, the consciousness identified itself as a man with the initials CR, aged 31 years old, who claimed to have been murdered in the Fox's house five years earlier and whose body was buried in the cellar. The incident, though its facts remained unproven, seemed to indicate that communication with the dead was possible. Word soon spread and the Fox sisters began to give public seances to demonstrate their powers in receiving spirit communication. The case received a great deal of attention in the Fox's community and was widely featured in the media. The girls became famous other mediums soon took up the cause, not just in America, but all over the world. In France, there was Eva Carriere, in Italy, Eusebia Palladino, and many more besides. Four years after its American incarnation, spiritualism arrived in England via a medium named Mrs. Hayden. In 1855, she was followed by a young Scottish American named Dan Daniel Douglas Holm. Holmes' seances, which were attended by some of the country's most eminent thinkers, produced many more wonders than the Fox's sister's wrappings. An accordion placed under the table and untouched by the medium played tunes. A piece of wood rose 10 inches from the table and floated about in the air, moving gently up and down as if it were on rippling water. A pencil stood up on its point and tried to write. Tables slid about untouched, luminous clouds were seen, and materialized hands carried flowers about the room. Home himself was seen to be lifted into the air, paralleling the levitations of many saints. And all this in a fair light, observes J. Arthur Hill in his 1918 book, Spiritualism, Its History, Phenomena, and Doctrine, usually one gas burner. By the end of the 19th century, the Western world was undergoing an increased interest in that which was empirical, rational, and verifiable through the scientific method. It was in this spirit that in 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was founded for the purpose of making an organized and systematic attempt to investigate various sorts of debatable phenomenon which are prima facie inexplicable on any generally recognized hypothesis. The stated aim of the society was to follow the facts wherever they might lead, to use the objective methods of science to investigate the shadowy, inexplicable realms of the supernatural and the occult. Men like Sir W. F. Barrett, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Mr. J. Arthur Hill, and Sir Oliver Lodge were all associated with the Society for Psychical Research at one time or another, and their good standing contributed to popularizing and legitimizing spiritualist beliefs. 
Although spiritualism and psychical research are not the same thing, the two went hand in glove for many years, one spiritual, one scientific, caught in a strange dance of what can be experienced and what can be proven, and the chasm that lay between. What went on in a seance? At its essence, it was the gathering of people in a darkened room, which through an alchemy of suggestion and imagination became a site of radical possibility, where those who are no longer living might once again find human voice or human form and pass on messages and comfort to those who they had loved in life. In spite of both the church's distrust in spiritualism and the movement's scientific aspirations, seances tended to have a pronounced sacramental tone. A seance would generally begin with a hymn or solemn prayer, very much from the Christian tradition, before moving on to more occult concerns. Lights were dimmed, hands were joined, and the medium would allow herself to become passive, receptive, and open to the spirits in the room. The most popular practice was probably trance mediumship, which involved four distinct entities. The first was the inquirer, who was a regular person seeking answers. Then there was the medium, also sometimes known as a sensitive, who had psychic abilities and would enter into an entranced state. Then there was what was known as the medium's control, a spirit who took possession of the entranced medium and spoke through them. And finally, the disincarnate spirits who would speak to the control and, via the medium, answer the, the inquirer's questions. Another variation of this was what was known as direct voice, which eliminated the need for a control. Instead, the medium did not enter into a trance necessarily, but simply relayed to the inquirer what the spirits were saying. Messages could be received through numerous means. One of the earliest and most enduring methods was via table wrapping, in which inquirers would ask questions and receive answers by way of short, sharp sounds delivered by the spirits. One for yes, two for no, and so forth. This was most often done sitting around a table with all participants holding hands to ensure that none of them were delivering the wraps themselves, but could also be achieved on any surface. Alfred Sinnott suggests in his book, The Occult World, for example, that you could set down a large glass clock shade on the hearth rug and get the medium after removing all rings from her hands and sitting well clear of the shade so that no part of her dress touched it to lay her hands on it. He goes on, putting a lamp on the ground opposite and sitting down on the hearth rug, one could see the undersurfaces of the hand resting on the glass, and still, under these perfectly satisfactory conditions, the wraps would come, clear and distinct, on the sonorous surface of the shade. Another method of receiving spirit communication was through automatic writing, in which the medium or sensitive would hold a pencil over a sheet of paper and write coherent and intelligible sentences without any conscious volition. According to the spiritualists, the script produced emanated from a human being who had passed on into the unseen. Those more inclined to look for a psychological explanation suggested that automatic writing emanated from the writer's subconscious mind. Arthur E. Waite, the editor of the occult journal, The Unknown World, for example, called it that dark borderline of mystery where deception and self-deception meet and join hands. A third phenomena was that of a ports, or the moving of matter through matter. This was then when the medium was able to make objects appear in the seance room through inexplicable means. Usually small items like flowers, ferns damp with dew, showers of sand, or hails of small stones. Sometimes the medium might deliver more ambitious objects like fetishes from Africa or Asia, stone tablets inscribed with mysterious text, or even live animals. One of the most sought after phenomena was that of materialization, where a spirit would take on corporeal form. These spirits were typically not of people known to the sitters, but figures who claimed to be from far earlier time periods or far flung lands frequently ancient Egypt, India, or pre-settlement America. 
Materialized spirits tended to appear as humans in luminous white robes who could speak and interact just as the living could and could even be captured on film. Sometimes there were other physical phenomena, such as firefly-like bluish gleams that would appear in the air and fly about the room, the appearance of clouds or dim white mists, the spontaneous presence of sweet smells, that of violets or roses, or incense or resinous wood, or a sudden dip in temperature. At other times, participants would hear the ringing of a bell or strange snatches of music emanating from nowhere. The poet W.B. Yeats thought of the spirit communication he received as a shared dream between himself and his wife, who was a medium. He writes that he experienced psychic phenomena as a dream that could take an objective form in sounds, in hallucinations, in scents, in flashes of light, in the movements of external objects. Whether these extraordinary phenomena were caused by disincarnate spirits, by the devil, by the medium's subconscious mind, or simply by fraud, depended very much on who you asked. Spiritualism came to prominence at a time when great advances in science were being made, from electricity to the wireless telegraph, to steam power, to aviation. This rapidly increasing scientific knowledge was regarded not as the enemy of these supernatural obsessions, but an encouragement to them. Electricity had given credence to notions of invisible energies operating beyond human comprehension. The telegraph had made communication possible over staggering distances. The world seemed poised on a great threshold of knowledge, and the hope was that spirit communication could be proven via scientific means. As Rosa Prayed writes in Dreams and Visions of the War, we of the present age have grown accustomed to scientific wonders. Their very familiarity leaves us cold. We do not always understand them, but we are content to accept their existence and to enjoy the comforts we derive from them. She goes on, how is it then that in regard to supernatural manifestations, or rather to manifestations which are held to be supernatural, the majority of us are only too ready to emulate the unenlightened attitude adopted towards science by our forefathers, simply because we fear to explore too deeply into the influences by which they are governed. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, one aspect of my research interest was looking at spiritualism in a specifically Australian context. The years leading up to the First World War were ones of progress and expansion for white Australians. The country was recently federated, imparting a new sense of national identity and patriotism that was separate from its identity as part of the British Commonwealth. Advances in medicine and nutrition meant that people were living longer and having better lives. While the growth of cinemas, gramophones, telephones and steam travel meant that people had more opportunity for fun and leisure than those stern Victorians of the previous era. There was a sense that Australia was a place of liberalism, a young country where old world customs and ways of living could be swept aside and new ideas embraced and explored it was from this fertile ground that radical ideas like spiritualism were able to flower. The Harbinger of Light, which is preserved on microfilm here at the National Library, provides a fascinating window into the occult concerns of Australia at the time. Within its pages are discussions of death and dying, reincarnation versus eternal life, the lost city of Atlantis, where the spirits can communicate by a telegraph machine, and the advantages of vegetarianism, as well as articles about prophetic dreams, women's rights, eugenics, pacifism, and folk religions. Toward the back of each issue are short progress reports from the spiritualist churches and organizations around Australia, and what really struck me is just how many of them there were. In 1915, for example, in Victoria alone, there was the Victorian Association of Spiritualists, the Spiritual Research Society, the Melbourne Progressive Spiritualistic Lyceum, the Brunswick Spiritualistic Lyceum, 
the Paran Spiritualistic Church, the Richmond Spiritualistic Church, the Society for Spiritual Progress Bendigo, and the Geelong Spiritual Research Society. Like its overseas counterparts, spiritualism in Australia attracted adherents from the intellectual classes, from scientists to businessmen to politicians. Alfred Deakin was an enthusiastic spiritualist as a young man and wrote for the Harbinger of Light under a pseudonym. He met his future wife, Elizabeth Martha Ann Brown, known as Patty, in 1874 at the Melbourne Progressive Lyceum, the Sunday school for the city's spiritualists, and she herself was a talented medium. Another prominent Australian to dabble in the occult was the artist and poet Norman Lindsay, who turned to the Ouija board for answers after the loss of his brother Reg in the Great War. Despite being stridently anti-religion, Norman wrote in his autobiography, My Mask, that the emotional insecurity brought on by the horror of the First World War sent nearly everybody into the back parlor limbo of spiritualism. Australia was and is a largely secular society, which meant there was a resistance to organized religion, especially among the middle and working classes. A 1913 editorial in the Harbinger of Light recognized the lack of a living faith in Australian cities and an ever-growing mass of non-churchgoers. People tended to be nominally Christian, undergoing baptism and perhaps attending church services during festivals and holidays, but there was no deep allegiance to tradition and dogma. A belief system like spiritualism offered religious feeling without the constraints or demands of conventional faith. Or, as one advertisement for the Melbourne Progressive Spiritualistic Lyceum put it, no creeds, no dogmas, no doctrines. Unlike most other religions at the time, spiritualism offered opportunity for spiritual authority for women as well as men. In fact, women were considered to be naturally more suited to mediumship, being thought of as essentially intuitive, passive, and receptive. In an anonymously penned book called Ghostland, the author writes that those best suited to mediumship were delicate and sensitive persons, young children, pure and simple-minded women, those, in fact, whose physical and nervous temperaments are negative and whose mind are receptive to the influence of others. By surrendering to that influence and disassociating from the physical world, women were able to open themselves to the spiritual world and its myriad inhabitants. Nearly every woman, writes Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in The New Revelation, is an undeveloped medium. In fact, spiritualism embraced progressive ideas and causes right from its inception. In America, it was closely associated with a group of radical Quakers who campaigned for women's rights and the abolition of slavery. And in Australia, it was associated with similarly liberal causes, including pacifism, the temperance movement, and women's suffrage. While the Society for Psychical Research was very much dominated by men, the mediums they studied, the keepers of the occult power, were more often than not women. Figures like the Fox sisters, Eusapia Palladino, Florence, Florence Cook, Emma Hardinge Britton and Etta Wright, and a great many more besides, found attention, opportunity, and status through spiritualism that would not have been otherwise available to them. A 1913 article titled Women and Her Position in Spirit Life in the Harbinger of Light contended that in spirit life, male and female spirits are given equally important work, each rule, each is given equal power, equal rank. It was only a small step from that idea that women might be deserving of those same privileges in their mortal life too. In terms of my novel, which unfortunately I'm not going to read from today because I just had too much research to cover, but in terms of my novel, I was interested in exploring how spiritualism might offer avenues for queer women to subvert conventional gender norms. 
I discovered, for example, that a medium might, in the name of spirit possession, assume a male persona and have license to speak and act as though she were a man. Some of these masculine spirits were known to be extremely flirtatious. Occasionally, female sitters fell in love with them. The seance room could also offer the opportunity for physical intimacy with other women, whether that was the touch of the faith healer, the linking of arms around the seance table, or the thrilling caress of a friendly spirit. It was also common practice for female sitters to search a medium prior to a materialization seance. This was to make sure that she wasn't hiding any props in her clothing or about her person but also offered extraordinary opportunity for intimate physical contact between women in a way that would have otherwise not been socially acceptable. Take, for example, this description of a dark seance from David P. Abbott's Behind the Scenes with the Mediums from 1916. The lady medium took this lady into a small room where absolute darkness reigned and had a sitting with her under test conditions. That is, the lady placed her toes on the medium's toes, her knees against the medium's knees, and she thought that she held the medium's hands. These kinds of practices are particularly significant when you consider cultural attitudes of the time. Discussions around homosexuality in general were largely limited to medical books. For example, Havelock Ellis's Sexual Inversion, published in 1896, or Richard von Kraft Ebbing's Psychopathia Sexualis, published in English in 1903. And even in those books, female homosexuality barely gets a mention. Lawmakers at the time did not criminalize homosexual acts between women because they simply refused to believe that such a thing could exist. Evidently, ghosts were seen a more likely prospect than lesbians. At the close of the Great War, it would still be several years before the British writer Radcliffe Hall would publish The Well of Loneliness and propel the notion of female homosexuality or sexual inversion as it was known into the wider public consciousness. But of course, just because people weren't talking or writing about queer women in this era, it doesn't mean that there were none. In Australia, for example, there was Dr. Lillian Cooper and her great friend, Mary Bedford, artist Irene Mort and her partner, Nora Weston, Agnes Goodsir, the painter who gave her name to Goodsir Place here in Canberra, uh, the Ida Leeson, the first woman to achieve a senior management position in an Australian library, and many others besides. In terms of the spiritualist movement, Rosa Prayed, who I've quoted from in this presentation, was a real life example. She was an Australian writer, most famous for her novels, uh, who emigrated to England with her husband in 1876. She separated from him a few years later and subsequently fell in love with a British medium named Nancy Harwood. The two of them lived together as intimate friends for 30 years until Nancy's death in 1927. Spiritualism had begun to decline in popularity around the turn of the century. There had been too many psychic phenomena debunked and too many mediums exposed as frauds. The Fox sisters confessed they had made the original spirit wrappings by way of cracking their toe joints. Disgraced, they both descended into alcoholism and died penniless and alone. The Society for Psychical Research continued to examine the supernatural and inexplicable, but they tended to come up with more proof for the side of the skeptics than they did for the faithful. The movement's brightest stars were exposed and extinguished one by one. Spiritualism's ascension wavered and devolved into petty infights between various factions of the faithful, while those disillusioned slunk back to the safe realms of conventional religion. But then war was declared. In Australia, over 400,000 men enlisted in the Australian Imperial Forces, and nearly one in every five of them was never to return. As every strata of society searched for meaning amidst such cataclysmic loss, 
there was a quickening of religious feeling which expressed itself both in conventional worship at churches and in more experimental and occult spheres. From all these classes, whether rich or poor, is drawn a companionship of the bereaved, writes Jane Stoddard in The Case Against Spiritualism, published in 1919. It is from them that the new spiritualism expects a multitude of recruits, for their eyes are looking towards the shadows. In Australia particularly, there was an anguish associated with having no body to bury, which led to grief without closure, robbed as they were of the usual rituals to mark out death and mourning. Perhaps he has no sleeping place even among the undistinguished dead, his body may have been utterly obliterated. His end may be subject for mysterious surmise, writes James Stoddard. If the churches cannot speak to the, to the mourners words of divine consolation, spiritualism will rush in with its false and fatal comfort. And rush in it did. The various churches in Australia were dismayed by spiritualism's resurgence in popularity as were the skeptics who had spent so long debunking its claims. A bishop remarked at the time, there have been more people sent to hell through spiritualism than by all the bullets and shrapnel of this war. Another book I read called Spiritualism, A War Disease, More Obnoxious Than the Flu. And yet, for many, the war served as an awakening for new possibilities and beliefs. Sir Oliver Lodge, after losing his son in the war, published Raymond, a widely read account of his experiences conversing with his son's spirit through a medium. Grief sparked a search for answers to urgent questions about the nature of death and what happens after it. As Estelle Steed writes in her introduction to Dreams and Visions of the War, Today, when we are living under the high pressure and amidst the turmoil of war, when men are daily going forth to face death, when thoughts and prayers for loved ones are filling the air and everything is vibrating more quickly, it would seem that at times the veil has been lifted and a realization of the unseen forces around allowed to many. The harbinger of light described legions of resistless emissaries from the higher spheres who would assist soldiers on the battlefield, while in a pamphlet called A Message to Humanity, definite, vital, and urgent communications from beyond the veil, I found an account of spirits making contact to reassure the living that they inhabited the battlefield to welcome slain soldiers into their new deathless life. When a sudden death takes place, we throw our psychic influence around the spirit body, causing it to relapse into, as near as we can explain, an unconscious condition, thereby alleviating the pain and the shock of the sudden wrench of the spirit from the body, and with loving care we convey the newborn spirit to a place of quiet rest, letting our influence surround it, so that on awakening the spirit may be kept within bound. There is a rich body of literature describing inexplicable phenomena experienced by both those at home and on the battlefield. Here's Rosa Prayed again. Since the war, there have been many remarkable case cases of visions commonly ascribed to telepathy, in which soldiers wounded on the battlefield have seemed to appear to their relatives at the exact moment of their great danger whilst there have been several more tragic instances also in which those at home have seen visions of dear ones killed in battle at the exact time of their death. Many of you will be familiar with the story of the Angel of Mons, a canny piece of war propaganda, but there were many other accounts of visions experienced by soldiers across the front here described by Bishop Weldon of the Manchester Cathedral in the Harbinger of Light. We have read lately of angels appearing, not only in the fateful crisis of the retreat from Mons, but also in the forced stress of battle at the Dardanelles. In the agony of warfare, it is only likely 
it is only too likely that men may see visions not the less significant to them, perhaps because they are spiritual and not objectively real. But the world is so full of mystery, there are so many things in heaven and earth as yet undiscovered and undreamt of in any philosophy that it would be as unscientific as it is irreligious to close the eyes and heart against the possibility of angelic ministries at the critical hour of human life. I'm sure that many of you are also familiar with the painting Men and Gate at Midnight, which is held at the Australian War Memorial. In the archives here, I found a booklet which detailed the circumstances of its creation, explaining how the painter, Will Longstaff, saw a vision of steel-helmeted spirits rising from the moonlit cornfields around him while attending the unveiling ceremony of the Men and Gate Memorial in Belgium and subsequently immortalized the experience in this work. He reportedly painted it in one session while still under psychic influence. As I was researching how the war caused so many people to reevaluate their relationships to faith and spirituality, I came across this reflection by Lillian Whiting. The world that existed before the breaking out of war seems receding in time, wraith-like, phantasmal, a dream, a faint reminiscence as of some pre-existence, as a life lived somewhere I know not on what divine ashore. The war destabilized the very foundations of society, forcing those left living to reckon with the terror of oblivion, the finality of death. The search for meaning makes sense. We humans are born storytellers, always looking for patterns in ink blots, in clouds, in the position of the stars. When we gaze into the darkness, we might see only shadows, or we might faintly see a face, perhaps just a suggestion of someone who we loved once and lost. Given the truly monumental loss of life sustained during the First World War, it is easy to understand spiritualism's appeal. The dead were not really dead. They were waiting just beyond the veil. The beloved who have gone before come to welcome those who are now suffering bereavement, assured the harbinger of light. They tell us of the welcoming of the slain, of the comforting and helping of the newcomers, fresh from the fields of carnage. Best of all, they show that the immortal man lives on, that in the very truth, our beloved cannot die. It seems appropriate to be undertaking <clears throat> excuse me. It seems appropriate to be undertaking this study in Canberra, a city that is so full of monuments to the dead, where no matter in which direction you look, your eye will be drawn to a cenotaph or a shrine or a memorial. The memory of the First World War is alive here. Its spirits are animated. I've been staying in the suburb of Deakin, named, of course, for Alfred Deakin, that most mystic of prime ministers. It's strange to think that the reach of this belief system went all of the way to the hallowed halls of Parliament House. But for all its focus on death, for all its occult concerns, spiritualism was a belief system that was founded on a hopeful premise that humanity was in a state of unfurling toward a better future, and that when death came, it was just one more step on a journey toward a fully realized self. That people were having these supernatural experiences was not a cause for alarm, but a sign that humanity was on the right path. We, as humans, are drawn to the unknown even at our most rational, we want to believe. As J. Arthur Hill writes in Man is a Spirit, we are growing toward the light. The veil is thinning. Some of us even now see through in gleams and a few of us with a certain amount of steadiness. 
if anything is a permanent feature of human consciousness, then perhaps this longing for revelation is it. Thank you very much. And we do have time for uh, a few questions. So uh, if there are people who would like to, to perhaps ask a question, uh, I would just ask that you uh, perhaps wait for a microphone to make its way to you because this is being recorded. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. That was, you know, it was such a generative and you know, fascinating talk. It's, I can't wait to read the book. Um, I wanted to ask you just a bit different question. So. You know, you laid out so beautifully, you know, the faith, the belief, you know, the longing for something, you know, what you, you, know, you eloquently said, beyond the veil and that. I was interested, in, though, in what you said about the sort of the ending of the movement, when you said the spiritual movement collapsed into fraud, into, you know, the um, people were found out and, you know. How did that sort of impact people's faith at the time, when all these ideas were coming out, when all these people were being exposed? And you know, ma many were exposed for mercenary interests. What you know, how, what impact did that have on spiritualism? So, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, when I say that spiritualism uh, sort of ended or declined, it's it's not strictly accurate. It still does exist as a belief system even today. There are still spiritualist churches, I'm sure, in Australia, certainly in America. Um, I guess that's one of the things with religion is that they do demand a certain amount of faith and you can provide as much proof uh, that you like that someone is faking that they're a trickster or a fraud but if you have faith that's not really going to matter. Um, I think spiritualism's one of the unique things about it was that it, it did have these scientific kind of aspirations where they were trying to scientifically prove that you know these phenomena were real but ultimately if that, if that uh, proof wasn't forthcoming, people would still have faith. Thank you very much. That was a terrific talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I was interested in, I wondered if you might expand on uh, one element of your talk because uh, um, I was fascinated by the way in which um, a, a really great um, Canadian writer, Wade Davis's documented at great length um, the way in which soldiers who served on the uh, front and served particularly on the Western Front, uh, and many of them spent years in trenches, etc. He, in his terrific book about the two climbing expeditions to Mount, Ever Mount Everest in the 1924 and 27, he documents how they became so inured to death that they would do what were, by any rational standard, truly illogical things, that they knew that there was a possibility that everyone in their tent at night would be dead tomorrow. And they'd, be, they'd, they'd sort of become callously inured in some way to death. I wondered what the collision between a cadre of people like that coming back into society would have in relation to... Because many of these people were... Uh, Cambridge or Oxbridge um, chaps, good chaps. Um, they, but I wonder what they would have when, they, as an intellectual force, when they came into collision with spiritualists. Mm, yeah, definitely. It's a really interesting um, topic. There, there was a great book that I read by um, Herewood Carrington, who wrote about specifically about kind of the soldiers' experience during the First World War, and his interest was partially in their psychological state, and then partially into what kind of spiritualist or supernatural phenomena that they were experiencing. Um, he kind of speaks about exactly what you were saying, where the soldiers were kind of inured to death, um, almost believing themselves immortal, which kind of bookends in a strange way into spiritualistic beliefs because they thought that sort of death was not an end but a continu continuation of life just in a kind of different plane. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to say how those people um, kind of folded back into society when they came back away from the front. I think many of them really struggled. I know that there was a lot, a very high rate of suicide amongst soldiers when they returned. Um, 
and whether they kind of found comfort in spiritualism or in conventional religion, probably it was a bit of both. Um, I'm just interested in kind of a corollary of what you were saying then is, as far as I know, there's no war art subsequent to the First World War about spiritual experiences. Do you know of any spiritual experiences from the Second World War or subsequent wars? And then, um, I mean, a lot of their suffering now, whether that's linked. Sure. Um, because my research has been very much focused on the First World War, I haven't actually really looked into the Second World War, subsequent wars, but I would be very, very surprised if there wasn't um, similar circumstances, similar instances of inexplicable phenomenon. Um, but I'm afraid I can't give you a specific example because it's a little bit beyond the scope of my research. But I think that generally speaking, in times of, of psychic stress, which war certainly puts people under, people are more likely to experience these kind of, of visions, whether that's simply through that psychological stress or if it's something um, more supernatural, who's to say? Thank you. Uh, thank you, very interesting. Um, I just wondered if your research is, is following that stream of scepticism about spiritualism and particularly the critique that spirit, you know, the, the fraud and uh, the, the, just the capacity of, of basically taking advantage of people's grief and, and how, how you're following that because I know that's a very strong tradition um, and the magicians who just said, look, they're just using standard tricks and there's a, there was a lot of that being said at the time and of course since as well. And yes, very much so. Um, there's a really fantastic book held here at the library called Behind the Scenes with the Mediums, where um, a, a man who practised as a medium but was also a kind of um, magician went around and, and basically interviewed all of the mediums in America and found out all of their tricks and then wrote a book about it. So you can go through and read how they made the luminous robes, how they made spirits appear, all of the you know tricks that they used. Um, within my novel, this is definitely going to be something that I explore. One of the other characters who I didn't mention in the beginning is um, a Roman Catholic priest who very much is of the opinion that the spiritualists are just taking advantage of people's grief and it's simply you know these parlor tricks and is is you know quite unethical. So um, I think part of the tension that I'm working with in the novel is between that kind of um, faith, between the occult and between science and how those three things kind of interact and, and affect each other. Hi, thanks Nadia, that was awesome. Um, I was just wondering, it's, it's a kind of a um, straightforward question, but I'm wondering whether um, spiritualists and any of the spiritualists that you have looked at um, made use of photography or, or photographic um, technologies, and if, if so, in what ways? Yes, they did. Um, photography was obviously becoming kind of much more popular around this time. I think the First World War was maybe the first war that had photography as kind of a big part of it. Um, but in terms of spiritualism, they were fascinated with the idea of spirit photographs, um, which could could be one of a couple of ways, whether it was just taking a photograph of someone and there would be these kind of ghostly faces appear um, sort of surrounding them. Or there was also, as I mentioned, um, when there were materialized spirits, the ones who actually kind of took on human form, they were also photographed. Um, from our point of view, when you look at them today, they, they're kind of laughably bad. Um, it's very, very obvious that it's either kind of like an exposed, a double negative, um, or that the, the, the kind of materialized spirits are in fact just um, either lay figures or 
just people in kind of robes. Um, but at the time, it was taken very, very seriously. In Melbourne, there was an exhibition of spirit photographs. I was devastated that there weren't any examples held here, um, although some of them were um, uh, in the Harbinger of Light on microfilm, so I kind of got to have a look at them. Um, but yes, it was kind of an interesting progression from the Victorian um, kind of obsession with photographing the dead and then through to this obsession with photographing spirits. So yeah, it definitely played a huge part. Thank you. Um, well, look, I think I'll just uh, uh, quickly um, uh, mention that uh, if this presentation has inspired your creative side, that you might be interested to know that applications for the 2022 Creative Arts Fellowship will open in June. So if you or somebody that you know would benefit from the opportunity of four weeks research in the National Library's collection, uh, you can visit their library's website and find out further information on how to apply. But uh, I would just like to end today with a big thank you to Nadia for a fascinating presentation. So thank you. Much.